Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, uh, especially in a market where people are so interested about microfinance. I uh, just before I begin, I just give you a brief background about myself. I have been involved in the field of microfinance automation for the last 23 years. Before that, I used to work for uh, a couple of French banks and an investment bank. Um, and we were actually making a lot of money for a lot of rich people. And, and that's when I decided that maybe we should do something for the poor. Uh, so that basically took me to Bangladesh. And I really appreciate the presentations that have thus far been made. And, I'm, and my uh, talk today here is about uh, you know, strategies uh, that are related to financial inclusion. Um, that actually happens, you know, that happens to be a case for all the developing countries of the world. We have been, uh, you know, I've, I've actually done the automation of BRAC, which is one of the biggest uh, MFIs in, in the country. We've also done the automation of uh, ACT Myanmar. And so, uh, you know, the question now is that, you know, strategies. Talking about strategies, you know, strategies actually have no meaning without having a goal. And um, unless you have a goal, um, you know, the, the steps that you need to take in terms of strategy has no value. So I need to actually say that, look, um, what is really the goal for financial inclusion? What is really, what are we exactly trying to achieve? Who are basically our clients, okay? We are talking about digital and digital, okay? Um, in most parts of Myanmar, I would say, I would say most parts, but many parts of Myanmar, we don't really have connectivity. So, I mean, digitization in those areas is actually not possible like the way we want to. We have the technology, but if, if the communication is not there, then what do you do? I mean, you know, it's like having a fantastic Mercedes-Benz sedan, and you're trying to basically climb a mountain with that. So it doesn't work. So what you have to do is to have some realistic appraisal of what is actually possible in this country at this moment in time. The present is actually more important because from the present comes the future, okay? So I would say that, you know, the reason why we are here is basically to understand that poverty and, um, you know, poverty and, and financial inclusion, you know, poverty is, is in fact correlated with financial exclusion. And so, um, if we are to actually make a change, then we have to understand how to reduce poverty. That is actually the, the, the reason why financial inclusion is, is basically the subject matter here today. So, you know, what exactly do we mean by financial inclusion? And I'll take it up from where William left, you know, he had actually made some very good points there. Um, you know, it's basically providing financial products and services to the unbanked or underbanked, okay, in a manner which is basically safe for them, okay, through uh, solid institutions, okay, through a regulatory framework which actually works for everybody. So these are basically some of the things. So I would actually say that if you look at the uh, strategy framework, I will actually talk about a framework uh, from where we can actually take it further. Um, Savings and deposit services, uh, credit facilities, insurance services, and payment and transfer facilities. These are some of the things that we must actually give out to the unbanked or the, those people who are actually not reachable right now from financial institutions, through financial institutions. And in order to do that, we need safe and sound institutions, okay? Um, how do we actually achieve that? Um, governance of clear regulations, and application of right technology, competition for choice. Now, you know, when we talk about, you know, payment systems, which seems to be taking the center stage right now for, for um, financial inclusion, but, but please remember that actually you need a CBS. Now, whether that CBS is in a, a decentralized database or whether it is a centralized database. If it is actually a central CBS, you know, centralized core banking solution, then you need connectivity. But if you don't have that connectivity, then what happens? Are you really reaching out to the target market that you had actually intended? The whole point of doing 
microfinance is basically to reach out to those people who are out of reach right now. Okay, that's, that's the reason why we are here. How do we actually involve those people who are out of reach right now, but we want to include them in a transformation where they will be part of the economy? So the whole point is, how do we actually involve them to be part of a much wider economy? So inclusive development of the economy. That's basically what we're look, looking out for. And so, these are the institutions that must be there. These are the things that must be there. Now, all these services that we have been talking about this morning is basically all the services are available through banks. But why is it that the banks are not providing these services? Why is it? I mean, they have got the technology, they have got the people, they have got everything there. But they are not out there. The reason is basically mindset. The mindset is simply not there because they are, uh, you know, branch based. They sit in a nice, comfortable office. You know, um, probably there is a nice, uh, cool air conditioner there. Um, and, uh, you know, the infrastructure that they have is geared towards uh, bigger clients. Okay. Um, and secondly, they have a collateral based culture. You know, if you don't have collateral, then forget it. So that's the other part of, you know, that that culture is in fact prohibiting a lot of people who want to basically get uh, finance. And they're good borrowers, in fact. I mean, all over the world we see that, uh, you know, the, the rate of repayment is 97% and up. That's huge. And also, you know, if we do a study, we did a study, in fact, in Africa, where the country was, um, uh, you know, attacked by Ebola. And for some time, they actually stopped collecting the payment because it was just not possible, it was too dangerous. But as soon as they were, it was gone, the repayment was 67%. They started coming back. So despite all of these statistics, the banks are not there. It's primarily because of the mindset, okay? Um, they are not really geared for high ticket, low volume transactions. I mean, sorry, uh, they are actually geared for high, high ticket, low volume uh, transactions. And they really don't like to talk to people with low literacy. So this is basically how the microfinance institutions came up. They are specialized institutions that actually focus on this target group. So now, who are in fact the key actors for financial inclusion? You see, you have the regulators and government agencies, and by that, I really mean not just the central bank. Um, I also mean many other government agencies who are involved in the decision-making process as to how a microfinance institution are, or how the financially uh, excluded can be incorporated in the mainstream economy. We have the donors, <laughs> investors, and lenders. You have the microfinance institutions, of course. And you have the MFI Association, who basically campaign on the behalf of their community um, with the regulators, sometimes not very effectively. In fact, most of the times, not very effectively. And you have the unbanked and the underbanked, basically the target group we're talking about, and telcos and technology partners. Now, because of the arrival of the telcos, the, uh, the landscape has somewhat changed. But believe me, it has not significantly changed. There's still a lot of work to be done in this area. And I'll tell you why. You see, um, the, the previous speaker already said that the amount of transactions that you can actually make through mobile money is, is limited. In Bangladesh, it, it recently been increased to 50,000 taka, which is uh, just about, uh, about $600. That's the maximum you can do in a day. Um, but some of some of the clients that we actually deal with, they deal with 125,000 US dollar. So that's just not possible. So that's that's the reality on the ground. Okay. Um, but nevertheless, you can make some small uh, payments, like you know, savings account, which is a voluntary savings, is a very small one. But then. Imagine uh, a borrower coming to the, uh, the collection point and making one part 
of the payment by mobile and the other part in cash is that really very effective? So if, you, if you're going to go um, digital, you might as well go digital all the way, okay? Now, to achieve, you know, uh, you know, um, must, you, you know, all of these players, if they don't work together, okay, it's, it becomes very difficult. And I've actually experienced that myself. We've been working for many years. We've been trying to talk to many players in the market. We, we of course, help them also with advice. Um, but I tell you what, the government agencies are difficult. The reason is, and I'll be honest with you in this regard, Difficult not only in this country, but I think all over the all over the world. The government agencies, uh, you know, do not necessarily allocate enough time to sit together. Um, they don't necessarily have a budget to um, sit together or, or allow the real decision makers to sit together and make some decisions that will actually help them out. And um, unless unless you have, you know, clearly defined key performance indicators for each group, you know, it becomes very difficult, it becomes frustrating. And I think that is a message that I want to bring to Myanmar also, because if you really want to get this done quickly, fast enough, then um, you have to bring all these different actors come together. Now, if I had known about this particular framework, say 10 years ago, uh, I can tell you, or, or rather 20 years ago, microfinance in Bangladesh would be 10 years ahead. Okay, so I hope that the players, the real players in this market come together and, uh, and, and basically make this change. So what, are, what is the strategy? Basically, you know, identify the lead stakeholder. Normally, this is somebody from the central bank. Um, establish working groups of stakeholders and a communication model. Okay, how do you actually communicate with, with one another? Um, and then identify Identify policy deficiencies, because certainly in, in Myanmar, there seems to be some serious policy deficiencies in, in Myanmar. Okay, so you have to identify them and, and basically now make somebody responsible to basically address those policies and come up with those policies. Okay, and, and you have to do that in a very systematic fashion. And then, you know, with, with each working group, if they have certain things to do, okay, in terms of development in, in terms of policy making, in terms of what they need to do, um, then you put them all together and come up with an overall roadmap, okay, what you want to do. And that is not necessarily something that you can do within a year. Sometimes this, this plan could be as long as 20 years, but then you have phased implementation. And I would say that take this as a, as a project, in fact, multi-phase project, you know, and as, I know, as you all know, a project is made up of scope, you know, uh, resource allocation and timelines. These have to be defined for each group. If you do that, then, you know, this, this project will actually see the, the light of day. Uh, treat, you know, as you go along, you will find that there are some problems. I mean, you have not really identified all the stakeholders. And, uh, and therefore, you may have to tweak your project implementation plan. And so if, if there are some risks that you notice, you have to really aggressively address that and address the risks and issues. So what are the likely roadblocks? I mean, there are many, but I've actually taken the, most, the four most difficult ones. You know, if you treat it as a project, in other words, there are certain things that we have to do and, and by certain people, defined individuals or defined groups of people, and by a certain timeline, then things become a lot easier. But to get all those actors together to actually work together is difficult. So this is one thing that is likely to be a roadblock. And you need a real good sponsor to basically support this, this, uh, this initiative. The second is uh, resolving conflicting views and agree on a common vision. Because unless you have a common vision, your strategy is not going to work. The common vision, I think William has already addressed that, and I really like that. If you can achieve that, that's brilliant, but you also need to have KPIs for those. Each and every group must have key performance indicators. You know, if you have that, then people become a lot more focused, and, and they basically start delivering. 
Um, the third thing is not seeing all the roadblocks in advance. That's the reason why you, you need to tweak your plan from time to time. You're going to sit together every three months, every six months, make sure that you know you are actually on the right direction. And the fourth thing is you know set smart goals. You know uh, something which you can actually uh, specific, measurable. You know uh, uh, you know what you, what you can deliver. Um, you know and, and the KPIs they are, have to be absolutely. Um, measurable, you know, so that the overall roadmap, as you go along, you know, you are actually achieving the things on time. I think that my time is up. Thank you. If you have some hard questions for me, please shoot. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. In the developing country, so 50 percent of the total MFI uh, reached to the, the digital finance using. So how long take time, according to your uh, according to your experience? How long take time to reach to the digital finance using in most of the, the, the developing country and 50 percent of the total MFI? Well, I tell you, I I have got experience of doing certain things in Bhutan, in Afghanistan, in Bangladesh. Okay. Uh, in Bhutan, um, we managed to, in fact, uh, introduce uh, mobile-based collection systems. Um, their collection offices had to go to places that were about three days' walk into the mountain areas. They would have to come back, and then they would actually upload everything into the system. So basically, it was a hybrid kind of a system whereby they would load the, the information, the, the collection information, into a mobile, and then basically do the collections. The challenge is that you know when you have a centralized solution and you have one of these things, and you basically collect money uh, from a distant location, and it takes three days to come back, then you can see three days interest is basically an actual risk at rest. So we have to basically tweak the system to make sure that that happens. The, the thing is, the, the the deployment of a digital system can be done within days, basically, so long as you have the connectivity. If you don't have the connectivity, then go for different types of strategies. You know, like for example, you know, I have a hybrid system whereby people can go just like the one that I've just discovered, uh, just described. Um, different strategies, different uh, challenges, different tools that you use. I mean, you cannot really say that I'm going to use a completely centralized solution. I mean, Pact is basically using a, a, a you know, hybrid solution whereby uh, 140 branches are actually online now, um, and the remaining branches are basically now offline. Uh, but they can send the data as as soon as you know the connectivity is there. But connectivity is actually the main issue right now. Okay, but it can be deployed very quickly. Once you have a proper CBS working, then it's it's uh, it's not a matter of, it's not a matter of months. It's just a matter of days. In fact. Thank okay. you very much. Thank See you. you. Thank you. It's a round of applause.